Hello, welcome everyone to Soul Sessions with Creative Mind. And we have a wonderful episode for you today about your true potential. Yeah, we've been doing a series on uh, Deborah's book, uh, Ooh, the new book. Let me get that out. Flash it over. Like a spark from fire. Break um, free from the past, shine your brilliance, and become your true self. And the forward by Dr. Rob Maldonado. And it's um, on everywhere books are sold. Yeah, and, uh, and so last time we talked a little bit about Tony Wolf and how these ideas of the feminine archetypes uh, kind of were conceptualized by her and Jung mm -hmm. in their work together. Uh, and then we, we kind of got to the point where we were talking about these deeper philosophical elements in the book. We um, touched on it a little bit. Yeah, and so we wanted to do this particular uh, episode uh, talking a little bit deeper on that topic. And so the title of this episode is How to Tap into Your Soul's Potential. So we're going to go deep. First of all. Yes. Because of what's going on in the world and mm. the news. Oh, yeah. We do want to give a shout out to the people of Ukraine and uh, just let them know that our hearts, our prayers, our meditations are definitely with you. Look at the colors. We're wearing Ukraine colors <laughs> on purpose for you tonight. Yeah, I mean, they show us uh, real human courage, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the willingness to stand up for freedom, which we know is always the case. If you look at history from around the world, um, people need to, to fight for freedom. Mm -hmm. it, it is not given freely, and uh, they're showing us the way. Mm. I find that uh, the President Zelensky is such an inspiration. I mean, he's in so much danger, but he's willing. Like uh, Sean Penn mentioned in an interview that he was born for this. He has some kind of quality. And so when we think about our soul's potential, mm -hmm. it's that, that we have to have that conviction within ourselves that we can um, create change in the world. We can't, we're meant to do something special. We're meant to have the freedom that we want in our life. And, and when we think about freedom in, in just our general small little worlds, I mean, so much is driven by our patterns and, and our misperception of who we are. And so mm -hmm. we're, we're not only are we fighting on the outside, but we're also there's a battle within to find the freedom to f truly freeze, free our life, choose our life, free our life, free it and choose it. Yes. Yeah. And, and speaking of Jung, um, he wrote this incredible book called The Undiscovered Self. If you're interested in understanding his views on politics, on mass media, on mass movements, on world wars. Mm -hmm. uh, he talks all about that in an incredible little pamphlet book called The Undiscovered Self. And so let's st talk about this idea like a spark from fire is uh, came from uh, the wonderful teacher Adi Shankara, who came from the non-dual philosophy of Vedanta, Abheita Vedanta, and um, and you know people would go to his his um, lectures and they would ask him all these challenging mm. questions, and one question was, "Who is my true self?" Yeah. And he used this metaphor of the spark and the fire to basically help us understand that we are the self. We are this universal self, but it's so hard to conceptualize. But if you could see them in a metaphor of fire, the spark is separate from the fire or appears separate, but it has the same exact substance. Mm -hmm. It is fire. It could actually burn, burn a hole and begin and create <laughs> a whole new fire if it wanted to and be identical. So it has, a, it has the same power. It's mm -hmm. just that our perception is limited by name and form and it appears separate, but it's one. And just like us, we appear separate from our universal powerful self but we are the self and that's the, the the kind of overall philosophy of the book is how do we how do we get in understand that how do we work through that and the journey to recognize it within ourselves so we can create the life we want yeah so those of you not familiar with adi shankara uh he's a great philosopher uh of the vedantic school or vedanta uh he He's really kind of what uh, Advaita Vedanta stands for, which is non-dualism. Uh, and the schools are still around today. Uh, they're worldwide. Uh, we were very much influenced by that school. 
uh, we we use the philosophy as the basis for our coaching work. And not and avaita means not two, right? Non dual. Non dual. And when we think about even Young's work, it's all about integration. It's not this is a bad part of me and this is a good part of me. It's about integration. So it really fits in well uh, with the whole philosophy. So let's start with the question of the difference between the soul and the universal self. So we're, we're talking that there is no difference, but how would you, um, why, why does it appear different? Yeah. So if, if we think about consciousness, and, and really Adi Shankar was uh, a master, a very sophisticated philosophy of what is consciousness? And for him, uh, well, let's say in the West, we're used to thinking of consciousness as synonymous with the brain or with the mind. Or being conscious, right? Yes, with that kind of cognition and thinking mm-hmm. through things. And of course, there is something to that. But in his philosophy, uh, consciousness is not our mind. Our mind, our brains uh, process consciousness and, and turn it into our human experience. Mm-hmm. But consciousness is a more foundational element of the universe. Mm. It is very much like what the quantum mechanical, um, uh, quantum physicists talk about as they're looking for the God particle. Mm-hmm. What, what is at the foundation of creation? That's what Adi Shankara means by the self or pure consciousness. It is a foundational ground of being not cognition, not thought, not uh, aware, human uh, cognitive processing. You read something um, in one of your books that I, I found very fascinating. And I don't know if it was Adi Shankara, but one of the same school of this philosophy. And you said consciousness, uh, the ego is conditioned consciousness, right. but consciousness cannot be conditioned. <laughs> so it's that, that, it's that uh, kind of that impossible, like a, uh, contradiction that we have to deal with is that we actually are always free it's just that appears that we have this little individual self that's fighting a battle in this world and just like in a dream where we think we're having all these experiences and we wake up and we realize that the the actual world that we see out here with our senses is a very same nature and that underneath all of it we're one and you know that's why when we think of wars and someone trying to like take over a country to get control from something external it really is an ego way of thinking of separateness of uh us versus them and this is just how we all have been conditioned in the world and and you can see what it creates uh this kind of separateness with all of us so um so when we think about the soul uh, what would be the purpose of having a soul and having uh, this kind of individualized experience of the self? Yeah, so if you if you think about uh, the question of who am I, mm-hmm. uh, like uh, it's more what am I? Mm-hmm. Like what, what am I? Am I a human being? Am I this awareness? Am I this cognition, this mind that I have? Uh, non-dualism uh, or the... The Vedanta uh, philosophy would say, you are the pure awareness. You are the pure awareness that pervades the whole universe and from which the, the, the manifested universe, the, the observable universe arises from. But you are that. In, a, in essence, the one that is asking that question, that awareness is the self. Mm. It is that universal pure infinite consciousness and i think we all get tripped up because our ego needs this sort of uh word to need put it in words and form mm. it, it doesn't like to deal with that ambiguity that kind of, right. it's it's really hard to conceptualize from from a person who has a body to say and, and have a, a five senses experience of i'm here and you're there and how can we be one it's it's really hard to conceptualize yeah. so it, it's almost like a veil that covers our awareness, that gives us the impression that there's two of us or that there's seven billion people <laughs> and animals and, and uh, planets and universes. Yeah. And, and all. Yeah, this whole idea that everything is just disjointed. And uh, you said once that I really loved uh, that we're all trying, we break the world in pieces and then we're all trying to pull it back together. We're trying to pull those pieces back. But we've, uh, but our, our, E- aware, e- ego awareness has broken everything in separateness. Very much so, yes. 
Uh, and so the soul does is there in it really mm. an end? They call it the jiva in. Uh, Advaita yeah, Vedanta. the jiva translates as as close as we can get it to this idea of individuality. Mm. Your individual existence mm. is a jiva, <clears throat> and it, it it is kind of like a soul. But um, the 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 concept of, in the West of the soul is closer to what's called the atman. So the atman is like the individual core of you that is identical to the self, to mm. the universal self, to, to that pure consciousness. Some people call it the God within or Christ within. Yes. You know, they're, they're, everyone has, you know, whatever religion you are, there's, there's a con- concept of that in that religion of there's a divine part of you. Like namaste, the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. That's right. So if you think about and and, the, and it's not hidden. This is this is the incredible philosophy of, uh, of Vedanta that it's it's saying it's not hidden. It's actually p- very present with us continuously, but because we are we are focusing on the objects, on the separateness of things, on the on the individual objects of existence, instead of the awareness of those objects, mm-hmm. and it says. The awareness of those objects is the Atman. It is the true self. It is that pure consciousness that it cannot be destroyed, cannot be altered, is always constant. The objects themselves are part of the illusory, the illusory nature of existence mm. because it's, they're always changing. Mm-hmm. Objects are continuously morphing and changing, but the awareness doesn't change. So it's like you walk into a room and there's silence, and then you start playing like heavy metal music and it's really loud and you can't hear the silence anymore. Mm. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the silence isn't there because it's the space where that music shows. But when you turn off the music, the silence reappears and reemerges or we're aware of it. So it's not that the silence disappears, but the awareness of that space that we're existing in, it kind of gets clouded. And, uh, and oh. so that's what happens with our mind. We have this beautiful place of a lot of people meditate to get to that silence but that those neat nagging thoughts get in the way and interrupts this beautiful peaceful place or that annoying person out there is having me obsess over them and uh you know i can't i just want peace <laughs> and uh and so we 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 have that uh it's like that duality that we're kind of wrestling with is to see that the other this other thought or this outside thing outside of this oneness <clears throat> is actually just an apparent reality. And I love that idea of the apparent reality versus the true reality. Yeah, it is an incredible thought. And and it accounts for the way we experience the world Mm. because uh, we know from perceptual sciences that uh, what we're seeing is not really out there. If we just go by, by, let's say, ordinary scientific understanding of the brain, the way it processes information, we know these color, these beautiful colors that we see, like the, this, this beautiful mustard yellow or, or whatever color, the particular yellow that is. <laughs> you don't know what tone yellow this is? <laughs> uh, this is canary yellow. <laughs> right. Uh, it's not really there. Yeah. It, it's not in the blouse, although it appears to be a, an intricate or an integral part of the blouse. It is really processed in the, the brain and is a mental experience. The color itself is a mental experience. It does not exist and, in the physical world. And we're ver- and it's verifiable by science. So yeah. when we start to n- understand just that k- simple concept, we can say, what else are we imagining in the world yes. that's not really there? And I think um, the, the covering, the ego creates problems that we that aren't even there but it it appears that way and and here's another example uh from a practical standpoint uh you ask someone to go to dinner and they don't respond Mm -hmm. your mind starts going oh are they mad at me oh yeah remember last time we spoke i might have said something that may have triggered oh i you know i you know and you start obsessing and thinking this person's mad and then the person said oh you know what my phone battery died i just got your message (laughs) and then like you created this problem in your own mind uh without the just be from that um stimulation of that person didn't respond and and we're doing that all the time with the external the external is giving us information and we are interpreting it 
individually where you would think, well, they probably, you know, they'll call me when they get there. But someone who's insecure about being needed or being wanted would interpret it very differently. So we, we do this all the time in the world. We, we all live in this kind of individual bubble of our ego's veil. And, uh, but underneath all of it is just that awareness that's yeah. You know, the problem was never there in the first place. It's like almost like rain, a storm coming, and then it, it ends. You know, our, our brain, our mind is constantly creating these psychological storms <laughs> and, and emotional storms in our life, To um, And even good storms, you know, like, wow, like, that was so amazing, like a beautiful waterfall. You know, we have these thrusts of joy as well, stimulated by what we, what we associate in the external. Very much so. So the Upanishads explain it this way. They, the apparent reality that you mentioned, which is called Maya, the principle of Maya is that illusory appearance of the world. Um, it's, it, it covers reality, meaning it covers the oneness of things, mm-hmm. and it makes it appear as if there are many instead of one principle, which is that infinite consciousness. And then we project our assumptions onto it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're experiencing. That's the human drama right there, playing out on the screen of the the apparent reality. And even ourselves, our identity, uh, my persona, Deborah Maldonado, is an idea that's not real. Like it's, for me, I have an idea of who I am. You have an idea who I am. My mother thinks of me differently. (laughs) My sisters, I'm sure there's people out there that, you know, think I have different opinions of me. So who is the real me? And it's like, we tend to, our ego tends to create this character and we self-identify with that we decide we have limits, that we Mm -hmm. think oh, I can't do that. They Only they can do that. And, and we, it creates this, not only the rea- reaction out there, but our relationship with our body and our identity to limit what we can cr- create in the world. And because we, our ego looks backwards and says, this is what's here, watch out for danger, and um, kind of collapses us into this limited space of identity. And duality, too, that we have that like uh, grasping for pleasure, moving away from pain all the time. Yeah, so let's uh, get to another question, which is, does the soul need healing? That's a really good question, because it's a lot of uh, soul work people talk about. And I think, I would think that young meant that you're working to reveal your soul, not fix your soul. Yes, so, uh, um, yeah, it would go back to the question of how do you define the soul? Yeah. What is the soul? Uh, and again, there are east-west differences yeah. as well as overlap. Uh, because, let's say, if the soul is the self, as in the east uh, or, or eastern philosophy, uh, we we read that uh, your soul is identical with the universal soul, which is the true self, the, that infinite consciousness. Uh, it would the not awareness be- that's not tied to Maya. Exactly. It would not need any healing because it cannot be damaged. Mm -hmm. And and if it's identical, meaning it's it's essentially the same substance as that infinite consciousness. Consciousness cannot be damaged. It cannot be hurt, cannot be split, cannot be burnt. And therefore, there is no need for healing. So in that philosophy, the ego itself is really when you're working on healing something, you're really just working on that. He, ego level, which in a way can be limiting because the ego is not real. So you're kind of working on something, the wrong, like you're working on this kind of story. I mean, it's okay to understand your ego and, and how it operates in the conditioning, yeah. but ultimately the freedom is when you realize nothing can harm me. Like I am invincible. I am, you know, nothing in the past can limit me. Yeah. So maybe in the West, they mean something different when they mm. say the soul needs healing mm-hmm. or the soul has been through some kind of trauma or some kind of injury. Like, a, well, I would say that, and from my early uh, dabbling in spirituality, uh, and, and there could be, you know, religions that believe that your soul carries karma with it from lifetime to lifetime. And I know that um, in Vedanta, they talk about that too, and Buddhism, and there's just like these samskaras that we carry from lifetime to lifetime. 
Th those would be part of the subtle impressions left mm -hmm. uh, on the mind, on mm -hmm. the human mind, that are then carried over. Uh, but the way I interpreted that is that what they, what they mean is more that if you continue to not realize the true nature of, of yourself, meaning that you are the infinite consciousness, the impressions that you experience as a human being in your lifetime uh, remain in your subtle mind. Mm. And those impressions are then carried on to the next life. But it's more what they mean is more like a going from a dream to another dream. Mm. So just like a, during the night, you have several dreams. And, and in one dream, you're at work and you're driving a car. And, and the next dream, you're in your childhood home in another situation. You go from one dream to the next dream without waking up in essence so you're trying to change the dream like it's like having a dream and saying i want to go back to that dream because you know i got ran over by a car and i got to go heal that leg and and all that those things and i i hurt someone in that dream i got to forgive myself and so you're spending a lot of time working on something that actually doesn't have any heart like lasting reality except what the mind associates with so if the mind associates with the ego mm. it it's it believes that there is some karma there, but if the mind associates with the self, it's basically free of karma. Uh, and of course, you can't just like think of it intellectually. You have to go through a process of individuation to realize that. And um, someone asked Adi Shankara, um, you know, because I've always had, you know, wrestled with this question we all have of, you know, do we have past lives? Do we, you know, what is it? What gets reincarnated? I mean, there's so many different theories. And Adi Shankara said, don't worry about it. Whatever you need to know is happening right now. Like, just focus on here and now. Forget about all the other lifetimes you've had. Focus on what's here and now. And then remember what you're seeing is Maya. You're not seeing a true nature of things. And I think that's the simplest way. Or, I mean, you, you and I talk about this too. Like, even if you think about your childhood, can you go back to every point in your life where you felt hurt or someone disappointed you or you had a heartache or you had joy and and like how do you come to terms with all that in just one life and can you imagine trying to fix everything from the past it's almost like uh it's a kind of keeping you busy for uh and not really creating and i think yeah. a lot of people even in just regular therapy they like talking about their past versus creating a new future and there's there's absolutely room for people to you should examine you know where your patterns come from and understanding um not push them away but there comes a point where it becomes more of a, an avoidant of creating something new absolutely so people can do that with spiritual work too is like i got to keep going and and there's this fear that i'm gonna mm. i don't want to reincarnate again like there's something terrible about this world that we have to like get out of it and where do we go yeah in uh, so in, in Vedanta, karma only really exists and is operating and, and impacting you as long as you identify as ego, as as an individual uh, jiva in essence. Isn't it like if you karma acts if you believe in it, in a way, Ka from a from an ego standpoint, like you believe that well, you not, are the not yeah. believe in the karma itself, but believe in this that you are the individual and there's punishment or yeah i don't know if it's belief exactly like that but it's it's certainly identifying with it mm -hmm. the, and identification means it's a little bit stronger than believing because uh, people believe all kinds of things but it, it's more like a knowing mm -hmm. so it, it, if your knowing is that you are this physical body and this individual ego then karma plays out and because your perception will be just like that person that didn't call, you're operating from those assumptions. And then your mind has a cognitive bias to filter out and, and see things that way in that reality. Yes. yes, that's the incredible thing about consciousness that we we understand it to be very much like water. It takes the shape of whatever like we pour it into. Mm -hmm. So we pour it into this this. Uh, the certainty that we are only a body mm -hmm. and and that's the way we exist that's the reality we create through mm -hmm. our consciousness so maya it says will take the form of whatever you believe mm -hmm. it to be mm -hmm. that's the magic of it 
And so we are already free. And like a lot of people here, you hear this, you're already enlightened. Now, the thing is, you can't just read a book or, or think, well, this is, this is, this sounds nice. I'm, I'm an unlimited person. And uh, you say your affirmations and you go out and be unlimited, but you have to come to terms with your ego. That's the, the real hard, um, the hard challenge is that you still have a body. And as long as you have a body, you have to deal with the ego and you have to deal with the shadow that the ego creates. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the next class, but I'd like to talk about just in general, why, how do we, how we can live from that potential? Mm. Like what is the path people take? And I think young, I mean, I love his, his uh, map of the soul. It's basically gives you a, a, a journey that you go on from start to finish of conditioning to freeing your mind through what he calls individuation. Yeah. Um, so what is the question? The question is, how can you discover and live your true potential? Yeah, uh, that's right. At the end of the day, we do need to be practical and, and ask that question, like, how do we apply these incredible uh, ideas that we've learned from philosophy? Um, and the, let's say the simple answer is this way, that we have to ask, what is our worldview? What are we assuming about the reality that we are experiencing? A lot of people think practicality is being, being grounded in a physical reality, physicalism, realism. They say be practical. If you could see it and touch it. And yes, and that's reality. But it's, it, science itself tells us that what you're perceiving is not really the truth, essentially. We're, our senses are not designed to give us uh, a perception of what's real and what's true. It's they're more designed to help us survive mm. in the moment. Like what what's good to eat, what's good for us as far as safety, moving towards warmth and comfort and and safety and away from danger. So our senses are not going to reveal to us the truth. And if we, if we use them for that, if mm -hmm. we use our senses to determine what is true and real and practical, we're missing the whole point mm -hmm. uh, of, of that understanding of perceptual science. So even emotions, as a lot of people say, just follow your gut. That's an intuition that is actually a false or a mis. It could be a misperception of what's Absolutely. real. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because you think you're, you're actually paying attention to your conditioning versus yes. so oh like i i hear a lot of people like my gut is telling me that this is too scary of a step and that i should wait and it's like that sounds like your ego it doesn't sound like it doesn't sound like a like a higher intuitive message and so the emotions are really a poor uh, or not poor but just a not reliable f source of intuitive higher knowledge that's right they're not designed because they're for from that. the senses the I'll, kinesthetic I'll, yeah, I like the metaphor of the mirage. Mm. So, for example, if you're if you see a mirage for the first time, uh, and many people are fooled when they see these mirages, they they'll think that's water right there. I can see it, mm -hmm. right? They're they're basing that that assumption on their senses that they, their eyes are showing them there's water in the distance. Therefore, I'm going to walk towards it, or I'm going to run towards it. Now. If you understand the principle of an optical illusion, you're not fooled by it. You understand mm. that's a mirage, right? It's an optical illusion. There is no water there. So the feeling would not, like if you are feeling like, ooh, like joy and relief when you see it, that's not telling you something true. It's your mind is connecting, ooh, water and relief to, to a feeling of, I'm going to live and I'm going to survive and I'm thirsty and yes. pleasure, right? Yes. Yeah, so the practical question then would it be practical to run towards the illusion mm -hmm. the optical illusion or not to run towards it mm. and of course the practical uh solution is not to run towards it because you understand what it is it's the same thing with the senses if you let if you're guided by the senses use them as your guide to reality you're like a person who is mistaking the the illusion for reality mm. and running towards that appearance that apparent reality when it's not really there that is not very practical 
you're going to waste a lot of your time, a lot of your energy chasing after mirages mm -hmm. in your life. If you go by this high, uh, higher knowledge, this philosophy of Vedanta, this philosophy of understanding of how, how do, is it that we perceive the world and what is the nature of that perception, then you're understanding things at a higher level. Then you can be very practical. In other words, you can use your thoughts, your time in, on earth, your energy towards moving to, towards things in a practical way, in a real practical way. Well, for me, I, I think it's really important. Early on when I did uh, my, I told you, my spiritual dabbling, there was a lot of messaging, dual messaging about getting rid of the negative emotions, be positive, mm. get rid of the negative thoughts. And, um, and I find that we can't live without negative emotions. I mean, it's just, that's just what life is. It's ups and downs. And integration is about that we can live and ride the waves that we're on a boat. And yeah, there's going to be waves, but we don't want to stop the waves because that's what makes it exciting and, and different. If it was still, we wouldn't move anywhere. So it's a part of the movement and the dance of life. But if we understand, like you said, it's a mirage that we're seeing, we lose all our fear. And then we can really create from a potential base because I could look at the, my five senses can tell me, oh, there's, you know, when I first started, um, my coach told me you should charge this amount for coaching. And I said to myself, no one's going to pay for that. No one's going to pay that money. No one's going to pay me. No one knows me. And uh, she said, no, you have to, this is what you, uh, you need to do. This is what you should charge. You're undercharging. And I remember um, just shifting my perspective of maybe that's possible. And I just started asking for it. And then people showed up and it was like, oh, but my mind had created this limitation that no, this is all you can have. People are, uh, you know, there's no one that wants to spend that much money on themselves. And there's no one that even for us, like there's no one that wants to do deep work. They all want the, the vision boards. You know, there's people that want deep work. So we we do the deeper work and have these deeper conversations. And so whatever it is in your life that you feel that's not possible because your mind is and your senses are telling you and even your friends and your community and the all the you know the swirling of media like what is possible for you if you buy into that that's what's going to be a reality and so what we're saying is see through the mirage and that's how you start to express yourself because i believe the soul has a big big dreams like the self didn't come here to be mediocre. The, the self didn't incarnate in your little body to to just <laughs> be scared. You know, it it came to see what it's made of, and that's really, it's it's uh it's natural tendencies to grow and expand and and uh, learn and see itself in all ways, and and if we play small and we just buy into that uh, mirage, uh, we will feel at the end of our life going what. What were we really afraid of? I remember you had said you worked in the hospital and you had sp spent the night with a man who had all these regrets of his life. Oh, many, many people. Mm. Uh, uh, when I worked in the night shift or in the, uh, on the night shift, it was, uh, you know, kind of part of my work uh, just to treat people during the night. And uh, many were on their last few days of life. And I would talk to them. And many had a lot of uh, regrets and they were trying to do this kind of work, but it was too late. They couldn't get you, up from their you, bed and make something happen with their life. Yeah. Well, not only that, but you don't have the time. Yeah. It, it's a process that you have to undergo to, to purify your mind, your awareness to the point where you can start to see reality as mm. it is instead of the apparent reality, like you were saying, the conditioned mind. Uh, you have to be able to purify that so you can get to the truth. And, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's always better to do it while you're young, while you're... Right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Today, when you have the time and, and energy to do it. What would be the first thing, from a practical standpoint, that someone can do besides, you know, going on the individuation process and reading my book and all those things, but from just today, what that can they do right now to start questioning their reality and, and seeing and practicing that, yeah. this higher knowledge. Yeah, it, it begins with self-inquiry. Mm -hmm. uh, sim that simple question of who am I? Mm. 
but taking it taking it seriously and making it a priority to mm. to really answer th- that question for yourself a- and then coaching of course is a great benefit for that process because it's collaborative collaborative inquiry meaning mm. so there's self inquiry and collaborative inquiry yes somebody else in collaboration with yourself are helping you find the answer to that question. Do you know that um, I did personal growth for since I was in my early 20s? And when I turned 40 and I started my own business, my first business uh, coaching and doing hypnotherapy, uh, I hired a coach. And in that year, I, I did more transformation in one year than I did in like 15 years because I, I had someone who held me accountable. I had someone who, you know, helped me question, like ask those questions, those yeah. inquiry. And um, I met you because I had a coach. You know, I, I think it, coaching is so, um, people don't realize the value. Uh, it's not about healing. It's not about fixing your past. It's about helping you rest, kind of get in, in the reins of your mind so you can see what's real because your ego will hide things from you make you believe things that aren't there and you'll get lost in your and then the people around you that are conditioned around you are going to see the world the same way you do you need someone on the outside of your bubble like a coach who has done individuation that says hey you know like i'm i could see it from a higher perspective here and they can kind of pull you up and help you see a new vantage point of your life. And I think that's really important and it's worth every penny. I mean, it's been life changing having coaches in my life and also us training coaches as well. And, um, and, and I also think pay attention to your dreams and see what is the, and and start to see the world as dreamlike. Uh, like if this was a dream, how would I interpret it? You know, something happened in your, your house, uh, your flat tire or someone's blocking your driveway or someone's, uh, you know, getting in an altercation with you or, or being certain way with you. What, what, what does that mean if, if it just happened in a dream and you're starting to see that what you're seeing isn't as real as you think it is? And I think that's the first step is just questioning what you're seeing. Mm-hmm. Am I really I mean, this is I think everyone needs to do this with the political climate of mass media and the messaging and people are just in their little bubbles, you have to have that critical thinking. Is this really, do I want to believe this instead of just being spoon fed what people are saying and, uh, and, and question for yourself. And that's what coaching does. It, it says, do you really think that like, is that really what, uh, what you want to live into? And uh, it, can you hear yourself thinking right now? Can you hear yourself? It's that reflective um, collaborative inquiry that I love about coaching. Yeah. Yeah. So it goes back to this idea, right? That if if your individual soul, your, your individual awareness, your consciousness is identical to the universal self, infinite consciousness, what, what are the implications of that? Right? That means that you can direct your life Mm. because you have that awareness. You have that ability to think and to will things into, into your life. Then you have to start practicing them. Uh, You have to be able to use them. And that's where meditation, uh, self uh, kind of actualization, observing your own mind, understanding what is the power of thought? What is the power of will? That's where all that comes in. And it takes time because we're so conditioned by the senses that it really takes effort for us to wake up from that. And you can't just do it by intellectual understanding. You have to work with the emotions. You have to. And I think one of the big things you can do is make a big goal in your life. Do something outside of your comfort zone. Start a business. Get into a relationship. I mean, anything that that challenges you is going to bring up all the things that are in the way of Mm. you keeping you in your comfort zone. So even you can force it to happen or, uh, or the world will force, you know, it'll just happen for you. Like uh, me, when I got, I lost my job and I lost my, my homeless manless jobless stage that I talk about. We have that dark night of the soul that really, you don't want to wait till that happens. You, you want to, um, proactively, uh, individuate. That's right. And what, what age, like around 30 in your thirties? Is when it starts? Uh, depends. I mean, I think a lot of people very early on kind of get the message that they're here to do something bigger than 
uh, kind of the ordinary life, mm -hmm. uh, and they they heed that calling and they follow it. Uh, I was very young when I kind of realized that that mm. no, I'm not here to do the ordinary thing. There's something calling me to do something extraordinary, and and then other people it takes a little bit longer. But regardless of when you heed the, that call, uh, it's worth it. It's mm -hmm. worth whatever sacrifices you have to make, whatever you have to do to, to follow that calling. And if we don't do it, we end up with wars. Uh, as a hum human race, you know, we end up with wars. We end up with separation, with acting out our unmet needs through <laughs> harming others. You know, and 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 we have to balance that out by becoming more self-aware, and that will save the world. The Maya that we live in, even though it is illusory, it's it's not that it's not real. It's just an apparent reality. So it's not just like a dream. The experience itself is real. That what we experience is real, but the nature of it is not what we what it what we uh, think it is. That's right. So it's not like oh, it's just an illusion, and we shouldn't buy into it. But we're having an experience here. There's a reason why. The self design, this ability to, for us to have an experience of an individual in a body. Like, what would be the reason is to remember who we are. Yeah. And so the, uh, at the end of the day, it's you are a spark from fire, meaning your awareness, your consciousness is identical to the universal mind, mm. to that pure, infinite awareness. And, and the implications of that are really profound. And individuation, the way Jung laid it out, is about realizing that. It's about finding uh, that path inward towards realization of that true self. Mm -hmm. So it's a journey we're all meant to be on. And um, we hope you check out the book. Uh, subscribe to our channel just click the button down here on youtube if you're watching us on youtube or if you're uh, listening to us on our podcast on spotify and all the channels apple podcasts just really uh make sure you subscribe so you can get notified of every episode and next week we're gonna dive deep into the ego we're gonna we're gonna teach you how to tame your ego and really go into conditioning and how that all works on a deeper level this was more of a high level conversation but i think it's so important to realize and we recognize that a lot of people come from different spiritual traditions and they may have a different approach to the soul but if you do ask just ask yourself this question is this empowering to me is this something mm -hmm. that i feel like can help me live my potential in life or is this holding me back and just just i would invite you to just investigate with a critical mind like i did of you know, what do I really want to believe? And that just don't take, because we say it either, you ask yourself, like, what is it that I believe? And look for the evidence to where that is. And if you don't have evidence, then you keep asking the question and that inquiry will lead you to the truth. All right. Take care, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.